we're covering the Grecian civilization. We're going to go a little bit more back to the past. We covered things concerning about Sparta and other communities in Greece, but we're going to cover a lot more a little bit later, but we're going to go a little bit back to the past. Remember, as you might recall, the Mycenaean civilization is the one that's the most ancient. So the Mycenaean civilization over here, the, it is from their time period that we eventually go a little bit more forward and forward to Sparta and to other time periods. Basically, it later hits the Dorian civilization, actually. So Mycenaean to Dorian, that's how the history goes. These are the dominant people during that time. During the Dorian time, we see Sparta coming out. So we're going to go a little bit backwards toward Mycenaean. This is the civilization found in Widowson's book, page 100, that gave us the conquerors of Troy. All right, so a lot of you have heard that uh, movie in Hollywood, Troy, and there's a lot of people who try to make stories and movies out of this. So some of these big names you may have heard concerning Troy, Achilles, Agamemnon, Odysseus, who's also called Ulysses, has few scant remains for us to examine. Most of our information comes from the epic poems of Homer, known as the Iliad and the Odyssey, about the legendary war between the city-states of the Greek mainland and the West Asia Minor city of Troy. So this is, all, uh, this is Asia Minor territory here. Troy is located around this part. This culture was more primitive than later Greek culture in industry, trade, and accomplishment. So Troy, you got to understand, where you hear about uh, the Iliad, Odyssey, etc. This is long before Homer, actually. Long before the uh, Hercules, perhaps, as well. And as well as, especially, the Greek philosophers in later Grecian culture. One thing that stands out is their metalwork, of which the best example is found in a tomb in Vaf Vafio near Sparta, where goldwork is very sophisticated and skillfully done. The double-headed axe, sacred also at Crete, is found here along with a mother goddess associated with a son and intertwined snakes as deities. The Cretan Rhea becomes Demeter, called by Durant as, quote, the Mater Dolorosa of the Greeks. After Demeter, the virgin mother of God. So no surprise there about Semiramis' religion being carried on to the time of ancient Troy. Civilizations, uh, let's keep reading. The Mycenaeans prospered after the fall of Crete and the Minoan civilization. Uh, remember, uh, I talked about Crete and the Minoan civilization that were before these guys. You might recall I was going through the Abrahamic timeline when mentioning these groups and that the Philistines came out during this timeline. They came from the area of Greece. So the Mycenaeans, they're the ones that next have prospered after the fall of Crete and Minoan civilization. Their artwork became even more distinctive. Their trade reached into the Near East and Troy apparently was a stumbling block. The Trojans, although given various origins, depending upon which historian you study, did have the same gods that the Greeks and Mycenaeans worshipped and feared the same demons. Durant believed that these people were originally from the Balkans, so we're, again from Troy. He believes they or their immediate ancestors are the same people mentioned by the Egyptians in a papyrus about those who fought at the Battle of Kadesh in or around 1287 BC. According to Durant, or 1294 BC, BC, according to Brian Parrott's The Battle Book. The theories about the origins of the people of both Achilles and Hector, so remember, uh, some of you may know that who lost to Achilles. The origins of those kind of people, so we're covering the timeline of Troy, where we get these famous heroes coming out. 
run on for book after book of endless assumptions and conjectures. The Iliad and the Odyssey, having been oral poetry, possibly long before they were put to pen and paper, might have embellished their characters as being more Greek than they were. Uh, he, Widowson recommends reading those two to get an idea about the events during that time with Troy. Duran says that around 1500 BC, according to Greek tradition, uh, uh, no, not that one. So we see over here that this is all about uh, Troy, Troy. So Iliad, Odyssey, you got to understand that they came out much later. The civilization of Troy was much more before during that timeline. Now we're going to see over here. Troy was actually sieged around 1192 BC. And then that's where Homer started to come in. So Homer, he started to come in and tell his uh, Grecian stories. And Homer was dated, according to Durant, around 840 BC. 840 BC. Now we're going to be covering a little bit more important events that happen afterwards. So let's cover a little bit more important events that happen afterward. Let me move a little bit to the side here so people can see the board more clearly. Some other important events that you would want to know during the ancient timeline. It goes as follows. Now I would recommend Widowson's book. Again, I would highly recommend it. He gives a timeline chart of ancient Greece uh, and ancient Rome. So it's really, really cool. So I'm only going to give you a portion. This is found at page 106 of his book. Durant's date of the Mycenaean age goes from 1600 to 1200 BC. <coughs> Excuse me. Durant also puts the foundation of Athens, right over here, the capital, by sea crops at 1581 BC. Now, all these dates are from Durant that I'm going to give to you. 1450 to 1400 BC is the destruction of Crete and Minoan civilization. Remember, they're the, really the ancient ones at that time, and they were being destroyed. And then the Mycenaeans pretty much really took over. 1313 BC, foundation of Thebes by Cadmus. 1192 BC, siege of Troy. 1104 BC, the Dorian invasion of Greece. So that's uh, by Durant. 1100 to 850 BC, migrations to Asia and around the Mediterranean Sea by Durant. 1000 BC, the Temple of Hera at Olympia. Then 840 BC, we finally reach the probable period, time period of Homer, uh, famous for his poems and his sayings. So this is what, all what happened during the ancient timeline, the ancient timeline. Now we're going to carry on a little bit more. So let me read some more points concerning about this ancient timeline and civilization. He has 776 BC as uh, Olympic, the first Olympic Games. So that's where the Olympic Games were held. And then if you look at uh, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where it talks about they run a race to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible, that's where we, uh, Paul got that idea concerning about the uh, games of Greece, the Olympic Games actually. That's why today we have the worldwide games where we call it the Olympics. They get the idea from the Grecians. 625 BC is Thales of Miletus. Uh, we're going to come a little bit to him a little later on. He's the one who accurately predicts and explains solar eclipses. So this is one of the earliest uh, philosophers, a.k.a. scholars, that came out. Now, not all in the list will be philosophers, all right? I want to make that important disclaimer. This is mostly where it's talking about the Greek scholars. That would be the more accurate wording. So I'm going to give you a list of names of all the Greeks. 
famous Greek scholars at that time. Now, for some people uh, who might be interested about some of these phrases, this is where the feminists might appreciate their history. So, according to Plutarch, so Plutarch's book, Lives, in his book, Lives, uh, he, he mentions about the Isminian Games and that basically Theseus fought a war with the Amazons, actually. And these were a true tribe of women warriors, actually. So these, uh, this is not fictional, this is actually real. But if you notice how the comics, how they do the Amazons and with Wonder Woman, they connect that with what kind of culture? Grecian, you notice that? So all that is connected to Grecian, you gotta understand. They were a tribe of women warriors who fought against Theseus. Now, if some of you might recall, Theseus, he's the guy that mainly uh, was really during the ancient timelines of as soon as Athens were founded and then as time passed by a little later on, Athens was at, the, was at a prosperous, starting a prosperous kingdom through Theseus. So that it happened during that timeline over there. Another one that the feminists might appreciate is that during the 500s BC, Greek poet Sappho, uh, Widowson says at page 106, Greek poet Sappho existed that time, leads a group of women devoted to music and poetry on the island of Lesbos. We get our word lesbian from this, just as we get our word archaic for something old or outdated from that period of Greek history. Actors in Greece begin to perform in open-air theaters wearing masks. So that's where the idea of movies and theaters come from, actually. Greece during that time, this is like basically uh, one of the pinnacles where a lot of our modern-day culture is adapting itself from. So scholasticism, arts, etc. Now we're going to cover some interesting things here. Now, Widowson, he mentions on page 102, he mentions some interesting things concerning about the philosophers. Now, remember, I told you this, the famous, if you study philosophy 101, one of the beginning guys that they would start off with is Socrates, actually. But there were philosophers before Socrates, but he's the main guy that they start out with. And then what you're going to find out, the historians mention, and I taught you this last time, the philosophers, they got their education all the way from Egypt. So remember, Egypt is the birthplace of all what you get from hell itself today. Egypt is the origin of all kinds of hellish stuff. Greece is the one that popularized it even more, and that modern society copycatted a lot of things. But Egypt is the origin of basically everything that is wrong, so to speak. So I'm going to give you a few big historian names here. Durant, he mentions that it was the belief of most Greeks that time that their culture came from Africa. Usher, he mentions about an Egyptian king named Danaeus who uh, fled to Greece around 1482 BC and he made himself king of Argus at 1474 BC. Eusebius, he actually says, Cecrops, an Egyptian, he transported a colony to Attica or Greece and established the Athenian kingdom at 1556 BC. Now, Widowson says this, it is known that from the 7th century onwards, under the Sai kings of Egypt, many famous Greeks traveled to Egypt to learn. Men such as Thales. Remember that guy? The, one of the earliest, if not the earliest, that we start the scholastic line. Men, so they went to Egypt to learn the wisdom of Egypt. Men such as Thales, Pythagoras, Solon, Plato, and Democritus visited Egypt. Now, Herodotus and Plutarch, 
Now, these two names you heard me mention quite often about ancient Grecian history. These two men claim that the concept of judgment after death, they learned it from the Egyptian religion, Osiris and Isis. They also claim that Demeter and Persephone stories were the ones that taught them about resurrection, actually. Now, this is from Widowson's book on page 102. Thales of Miletus learned geometry in Egypt. Rosius and Theodorus of Samos learned the art of hollow casting in bronze and pottery, textiles, metalworking, and ivory. Greece merged its own gods with Bible truths and Egyptian and Assyrian, Canaanite, and Babylonian myths and passed that mixture on to Rome. The Phoenicians also had a great influence upon the Greeks. So basically, now we can see why modern society, a lot of it, you can trace it from Greece. You know why? Greece is a culmination of everything bad that we talked about, of everything bad nation. Yeah. Phoenicia, Canaanite, uh, Babylon, Egypt especially. And then uh, Babylon, I, I did mention that one, where, where I go back from, not Nebuchadnezzar's timeline, but Babylon, ancient, where it goes to Semiramis Nimrod. So Greece is a combination of everything bad, okay? And modern society is just the melting pot of all the worst things that you can think about. Be open-minded, right, they claim. They just want to welcome more garbage. That's the idea. All right, now this is uh, a list of philosophers that you want to know. So here are the big names. Anaximander, he dies around 547 B.C. And this is from Durant's book. Anaximander was the one first known believers in evolution, actually. That's the idea of where evolution comes from. So evolution is a pagan religion, bless God. That's what you got to understand. Amen. He also mentioned about the earth was covered by many floods over time. Wonder where they got it from, right? Remember, Greek myths, they mingled their truths from the Bible and everything bad out there. Why? Because, remember, Greece, Grecians, all they wanted to do was talk about something new, Paul mentioned in Acts chapter 17. They wanted to accumulate all the knowledge. Anaximenes, he's a, philosoph he's a philosopher, He's born during this time. This is all found in Durant's work, actually. Pythagoras, he's the one that founded the Pythagorean theorem. All right, other philosophers here. We see uh, Herodotus. Remember, I quote, quoted him quite often. Herodotus, he's the one, the father of history, so to speak. He is born at 480 B.C., and that's claimed by Widowson at page 107. Greek historian Thucydides, I think that's how you pronounce his name, he's the author of History of the Peloponnesian Wars. Greek physician Alcmaeon, let's see right here, he's born during this timeline, 470 BC becomes first known physician to practice dissection of human bodies actually so this is from Alcameon Hippocrates you've heard of that name before right so Hippocrates he's dated around 460 BC the physician's Hippocratic Oath is born at that time. Socrates, finally. All right. Socrates was when? Socrates was 469 B.C. Then you got Democritus, 440 B.C. Then you also have, let's see over here, 
Aesop's Fables, you've heard of that before? Aesop's Fable comes out at 300 BC. Then you have Plato. He founded his academy. And guess what? Paul was there. He was at Plato's academy. Yeah. What was he doing? He was preach, street preaching the gospel to Amen. them. So maybe some of you should go street preaching on an academy campus. Bless Amen. God. All right. Uh, Widowson mentions on page 108 about Plato. He influenced ancient Catholic philosophy to a large degree. He wrote the famous The Republic, which idealizes a fascist, fascist state where an intellectual elite rules as master over a subordinate populace. Aristotle, born 384 BC. Then we come to Aristotle. Now, Socrates, uh, he's a very alarming person. If you read about him, he's definitely a pervert. That's what I'll say. He's a homo. Uh, I remembered uh, during my advanced theology class, Dr. Rutman was reading a quote from Socrates. And this is something, un unless you get scholastic uh, connections and research, actually. So Dr. Rutman must have dug up an old book or something. Because I can't dig up the quote and passage, actually. It's something where you have to have school research paper access or something. But basically, Socrates, um, he mentioned about where he, one of these men took off his outer garment and robe and showed off his underwear. And Socrates mentioned a burning sensation when he saw that. So it's just very <laughs> disturbing. So that's, uh, that's your birthplace yeah. of higher education and philosophy. Yeah. All right? You get cuckoo like that. Now, you notice that Grecian philosophy and education is not very different from today's modern society. Yeah. Greece is a perfect example of today's day and age. Greece. Why? Because Greece is a culmination of everything bad that we talked about in our previous lessons. So if you want to give a great example of America and modern society today, all you have to do is go to Greece. That's all you have to do. And everything wrong with Greece, you'll find it in America. God bless America, right? <laughs> so this is the, our wicked world. Uh, I forgot to mention Democritus. The reason why he's uh, famous at 444 BC is he proposes the atomic theory. And theory that our galaxy, the Milky Way, is composed of many stars, actually. So... Some things to know about him. All right. Uh, now, as we look at page 104, I'm going to read some things about Corinth over here. Where's Corinth? Oh, there you are. All right. So Corinth over here. Why is Corinth important in your Bible? Because Corinth, uh, in your Bible, that's where your first and second Corinthians came from. And it was a lascivious, wicked, fleshly city, actually, that Paul had so much trouble. And Corinth, uh, I'm going to tell you some things about them. The reason why they're very important is because of their Athenian connection, actually. Their connection with uh, Athens. So Corinth is very important, actually, for Grecian history. Page 104 reads, Until the mid-6th century, Corinth was a major exporter of black figure pottery, to cities around the Greek world. Athenian potters later came to dominate the market. Corinth's great temple on its Acropolis was dedicated to Aphrodite. According to most sources, there were more than 1,000, listen up, there were more than 1,000 temple prostitutes employed at the temple of Aphrodite. No wonder Corinth was a major fleshly city problem. Uh, but uh, it's not like that we have 1,000 prostitutes running around and pornography running rampant, which is making billions and billions. And then, I mean, uh, not much different, right? I mean, we're much better than Corinth, it looks like, right? <laughs> hmm. What men learn from history is what, church? Men never learn from history, all right? In ancient Greece, a Corinthian girl... When you hear the term Corinthian girl, so if Paul wrote uh, Corinthian girl, then actually it was a common nickname for a prostitute, actually. 
Corinth was also the host of the Isminian games that I talked about earlier. All right. 7th century BC, when Corinth was ruled by the tyrants Cypselus and Periander, the city sent forth colonists to found new settlements. Syracuse, Embracia, and with Corsera, itself perhaps the site of an early Corinthian settlement. Apollonia and Anactorium, the city was a major participant in the Persian Wars, but afterwards was frequently an enemy of Athens and an ally of Sparta in the Peloponnesian League. In 431 BC, one of the factors leading to the Peloponnesian War was the dispute between Corinth and Athens over the Corinthian colony of Corsera. So I told you Corinth has some sort of relationship, connection with Athens. They, uh, it's a very powerful group that uh, Athens was rivaling with, actually. Fourth century BC, Corinth was home to Diogenes of Sinope, one of the world's best known cynics. The Romans under Lucius Mummius destroyed Corinth following a siege in 146 BC. When he entered the city, Mummius put all the men to the sword and sold the women and children into slavery before he torched the city, for which he was given the cognomen Achaicus uh, as the conqueror of the Achaean League. While there is archaeological evidence of some minimal habitation in the years afterwards, Julius Caesar, that you know that famous name, right? Julius Caesar, refounded that city as Colonia Iaus Iulia Corinthiensis in 44 BC, shortly before his assassination. According to Appian, the new settlers were drawn from freedmen of Rome. Under the Romans, it became the seat of government for southern Greece or Achaia. Actually, uh, he, let's look at Acts chapter 18 about that. Acts chapter 18, verse 12. Acts chapter 18, and then we'll look at verse 12. While you're turning there, let me keep reading. It was noted for its wealth and for the luxurious, immoral, and vicious habits of the people. Yeah, that's why Paul had a problem with these people. It had a large mixed population of Roman, Greeks, and Jews, which is why Paul mentioned at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he termed it our fathers who passed to the Red Sea. Why would he write that to the Corinthians if there weren't Jews in there? See, because it's very mingled. It was very mingled. One thing to note of the preceding paragraphs is that the temple prostitutes in the Acropolis of Corinth had short hair, according to Spira's Zodiacs, which is the basis for Paul's approval of the Corinthian church's insistence upon its women growing their hair long in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, so that the Christian women of that city could in no way be confused with them. I'm sorry, it is. We're confused with them. See, that's why we believe, ladies, about there should be a distinction. There, uh, that's why we make a big deal, men, about having short hair and then women having long hair. Why? There has to be a distinction. And if you don't agree with that one, then according to history, this is history, all right? History, I'm not saying biblically, but historically, during that time when Paul wrote it, you were considered a prostitute. But a lot of ladies, they are drawn to the worldly dressing, right? Not just short hair, but worldly dressing. And all of that gives a, an adulterous, uh, it gives a, a luring spirit. So see that satanic spirit ever since uh, 1 Corinthians 11 about women's dressing carried on all the way to today, you got to understand. It has a root. So that's why Christians make a big deal about proper dressing. Okay, anyways... Uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 12 through 16. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you, but if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took 
Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, and Galileo cared for none of those things. So if you read this uh, passage over here, it's actually talking about the Romans where they took the Corinth as the seat of government for southern Greece or Achaia that time, which Paul mentioned. So that's what life was like during that time, if you read Acts chapter 18. Now, the one that uh, would probably be the most interesting is Macedonia, actually. Macedonia. That's where Paul, he received his vision about going, right? So come over to Macedonia and help us, Paul. And Paul, he actually went to Macedonia. Because why? Because Greece had a history of lewdness and wickedness. And God used the Apostle Paul to deliver the light of the glorious gospel to these people. And that's where we get one of the most important epistles in Laodicean Church Age today, First and Second Corinthians. So God used Paul in that sense. So let's talk about Macedonia because that's where we come to the end of uh, ancient Grecian civilization and their power and their empire that spread until Rome took it over. Alexander the Great. Macedon, that's its original name, which had been founded, this is page 105 of Widowson's book, which had been founded in the 7th or 8th century BC, grew in power under Philip II of Macedon, who's around 359 BC to 336 BC, and conquered its neighbors. Alexander dated 336 to 323 BC, known as Alexander the Great in history. And Alexander the Great, so his death, uh, his reign starts after, Aris, uh, it goes from Aristotle, right? Then uh, they have Demosthenes, who's the greatest Greek orator who lived, and then began Alexander the Great, 336 BC. So Alexander comes after Aristotle, actually. But Aristotle, he was uh, learned with all the wisdom of the Egyptians, which was carried on to Greece, actually. But basically, let's keep reading here. He's obviously known as Alexander the Great in history. Carried this expansion onward to conquer the Persian Empire and Egypt, where he had himself declared himself to be the Son of God, actually. That's why, why do you think, go to Daniel 8, why was Alexander the Great a great picture and type of the who? Antichrist. Because the Antichrist is supposed to be an imitation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So, turn to Daniel chapter 8. As you turn over there, I'll keep reading. He spread the Greek language, culture, and religion as far east as did the former merchants and mercenaries west and south. So, that's why, you got to understand, because of Alexander the Great, that's why during that time the New Testament for the Gentile language was Greece. It was Greece. Rome tried to achieve Latin, see, because Latin is their, the most ancient history, the Latin people actually, but I'll come to them a little later on. But Rome tried to triumph over that and they tried to get their Latin Vulgate Bible out, actually. But the Bible, uh, the Lord protected the Greek Receptus manuscripts where it's still triumph against the Roman Catholic Bible, actually. Amen. So Greece was the one that spread its language, and then Rome took it over, and then Satan tried to drown it out, but the Lord's like, no, you're not going to drown out my Bible. He used the Grecian language, and it's amazing that today, that scholars, when they talk about ancient Bible literature, they deify not Roman Latin language, it's what? The original Greek. Yeah, how about that? Hmm? All right. He died after a drinking bout. So like Cyrus the Great, right? Cyrus the Great and Alexander, they were both conquerors, at, but they had a drinking problem over there. He died after a drinking bout as a result of poisoning or of a disease or combination thereof. And you know when he died? The age of 33. Greatest type of Antichrist in history, right? So let's look at the Bible, Daniel. Chapter 8. 
And then we'll read verse 23. And the lad, uh, look at verse uh, 20. Verse 20. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of who? Media and Persia. Remember, Media and Persia were the great powers during that time. You recall that? So what's going to happen? The Bible prophesied. Daniel prophesied this long before Greece took over, actually. 21, and the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, so what happened over here is that there was a ram with two horns, but it was conquered by the rough goat who had one horn. So this one horn goat conquered this ram with two horns, which is Media and Persia. But what happened to this rough goat after he died, uh, there was a split in his kingdom at verse 22. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. So that's what happened after Alexander the Great died. It was divided amongst his four generals. But look at Daniel chapter 10 now. Daniel chapter 10. Oh, uh, I didn't finish reading Daniel 8, but if you keep finishing reading Daniel 8, where at verse 22, 23, 24, 25, all of a sudden, the context of Alexander the Great switches to the Antichrist. But you would think they're the same person. Why? Because Alexander the Great is a type of the Antichrist. Daniel 10, verse 20. So now let's look at behind the scenes. So behind the scenes, as we look at our history, remember that, so there is no mention of God's kingdom. You notice that throughout this whole history class? Why? Because remember I told you a couple classes ago, God is done. He is done with his kingdom of heaven reign. So uh, during that time, uh, what's going on? The Jews are under the reign of the devil. The devil is the king over the world. So God doesn't pay much attention to these guys. You notice that? He doesn't describe in great detail their history. All he uses it for is prophecy. That's about it. But he doesn't go into great detail about it because he doesn't care about the satanic kingdom. He goes into great detail about the Old Testament, his kingdom, kingdom of heaven, and then the New Testament, the church, which is his kingdom of God. That's what's going on. So the satanic kingdom, it's all under Satan's reign. So this is all Satan's reign. That's why all of this is spreading out. The height of civilization, quote-unquote technology, advancement, industry, etc., etc., is all be uh, is at the height of Satan's kingdom. Greece was spreading it out. Greece was spreading out that uh, culture and that civilization. Verse 20, Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. So notice that Satan's kingdom, Persia, the angelic being had trouble fighting with who? With uh, one of those demonic creatures. He's called uh, prince of Persia. But now it switches to what? Prince of Grecia. Why? Satan's spirit is carrying on from here to here now. That's what's going on. Okay, so let's read a little bit more about our history over here. So, Alexander the Great, he was divided amongst his four generals, and they were called the Diodoci. Ruled this vast area in varying degrees. This is found on page 106 now of Whittleson's book. Ruled this vast area in varying degrees until much of it was taken by Rome. This was a Hellenistic period of ancient Near Eastern history with Greek influence all the way to Western India. The word Helleni for the Greeks is derived from their earliest times, if you will note what we said. Uh, Alexander was said, according to legend, to have been the offspring of Zeus and his mother, his conception being witnessed secretly by his father, Philip II. Glorification by historians aside, he was, from a biblical perspective, an evil, immoral tyrant. If you are interested in studying Alexander, I would recommend Theodore Dodge's book, Alexander, <laughs> rather than some ignorant movie, which is apparently how most modern people get their history. <laughs> now, there is something, uh, one interesting note from Alexander that I heard from... Uh, Pastor Donovan in his sermon, he mentioned about Alexander that this guy, he was so much full of the devil that and conquering kingdoms, 
in a rage that one time that uh, they were trying to go over a wall, but his soldiers were cowarded and fell back in the midst of arrows and fire and God knows oil, all that kind of stuff. And then Alexander the Great told them to climb up the wall, but they couldn't. And then he called them cowards and he said, cowards, watch me. And then he went up the wall in the midst of those arrows and uh, all the, God knows, oil, fire, etc. And he just went through it like a, demo, a demon possessed person and overthrew and conquered his enemies up the wall and was able to open the door for them. So he was definitely full of the devil. Now, let's cover the rise of Rome. So, meanwhile, while I talked about ancient Greece, Rome, I'm going to talk about what they did in its ancient timeline and how they eventually came to power. And I'm only going to cover a little bit because time is almost up, actually. So, I'm going to cover a little bit over here. But Rome also has a very intense, interesting history as well. Widow Sins mentions on page 90, Although people began moving in, into the Italian peninsula around 2000 BC and built villages on pilings sunk in the water to keep them safe from animal attack, the first named inhabitants of that place were called the Etruscans. All right, so that's the one that you want to know. This is a very important name for ancient Roman history. And then we're going to be we're going to be hitting a little bit more to the Latins too. So let me keep reading over here. Now, I mentioned a little bit about the Etruscans uh, during the ancient uh, 2000 uh, around the uh, ancient BCs of ancient Israel. Widowson mentions, they ruled the Romans for over a century and left 8,000 inscriptions and numerable, numerable works of art to give us some clue as to what their lives were like. The Romans, the Greeks, and the Etrus uh, Etruscans themselves all agreed that they came from Asia Minor, modern Turkey, probably Lydia. Now, this is interesting. These Etruscans, probably Lydia, if that's the case, Lydia's capital was Sardis which is where one of the, uh, the churches that the book of Revelation mentioned over there, okay? The Etruscans who resided primarily in the present day area known as Tuscany were ruled by a loose federation of tribes dominated by the Tarquini, among others. Through the 6th century before they were subdued by Rome, they were the strongest political force in Italy with a well-organized army a famous cavalry and a powerful navy that ruled what is still called the Tarhine or Etruscan, uh, Etruscan Sea. Like Rome, their rule started out as a monarchy, then became an oligarchy of important families, then an assembly of citizens with property who voted annually for magistrates. So uh, it's kind of imitating about uh, later history. We went from kings and then to a body and then assembly of citizens who vote annually for magistrates. So we can see that our modern history is very similar with ancient history that time. Their tombs reveal that they had imported, imported rather advanced medicine from Egypt and Greece and dental bridge work had been found. The tombs also abound in jewelry. They love to wage war, hunt, bullfight in the arena, have chariot races sometimes pulled by four horse teams through Discus and Javelin, pole vaulted, raced, wrestled, boxed, and fought in glad gladiator, uh, okay, gladiators, basically, that's what he's driving at. Their tomb paintings uh, reveal all of this along with their propensity for cruelty, weightlifting, gambling with dice, playing the flute, and dancing. Like all ancient peoples, they practiced slavery and bouts of riotous drunkenness. So, Paul, he mentioned also at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, about beating the air when he's fighting. So that comes from Roman civilization. But this, uh, the Etruscans, they practice that actually, which, were, which was long before. So these people are very important because they were the dominators before the Roman Republic was born. Their uh, religion consisted of a greatest god named Tinia, 
who was a god of thunder and lightning. He had a circle of gods who did his bidding without question, called the Twelve Great Gods, whose names it was forbidden to mention. Mantis and Mania were master and mistress of the underworld, ruling a horde of winged demons. The Etruscans divined the future like the Babylonians by examining the entrails of sheep, and they practiced animal and human sacrifice. Prisoners of war were massacred as uh, uh, Phocians in 535 BC were stoned to death in the Forum of Seri as some 300 Romans captured in 358 BC were sacrificed at the town of Tarquinini. The Etruscans believed that a slain enemy escaped the clutches of hell. They had a highly developed view of hell where one went to be judged, then was either punished or sent to reside with the gods. Normally they buried their dead, but cremation was also practiced. Historians only know about Etruscan history by the artwork they left behind, with the most famous of it being their pottery. They captured Rome in about 618 BC and ruled for a hundred years, influencing the attitudes and practices of that culture. So that's all the Etruscans. And then next time, uh, next discipleship, I have to stop there. I was hoping I can finish this. The reason why these people are important that you need to know their history is because this is how this group was. And then they later conquered where later on Latins, Sabines, and etc. are coming out. But the first inhabitants of Rome, basically the Etruscans took it over. And then there was an interesting history that carried on. And then we go to Roman kings... And then it goes to a Roman Republic before Caesars come out, actually. So we'll cover more of that history later on. And some interesting things about Rome being known as Seven Hills. It is actually called during ancient timeline Seven Mountains, which is why John wrote it that way. So I'm going to cover more of that in our next discipleship class. All right, your homework assignment. Listen to the next ad lib commentary track. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, we've learned a lot from our history where we can realize how Satan is truly the god of this world and how modern societies are truly imitating and running by it. And that we cannot run like how society runs according to its pagan system. But we got to go by the biblical route. Help us to keep our eyes on the book. Help us to have our focus and attention in the right place in your word. And that we don't follow the pattern of what wicked societies have done. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.